In this video, we talk about line integrals in space. This is an introduction to the topic, and there are some really interesting applications which we'll get to in the third video of this section. In this section, we will learn to integrate a function over a curve C. So here's a geometric interpretation of what we're doing. Say we have some function f of x, y, and so it's a three-dimensional function because it's z equals some function of x and y. And then we also have some two-dimensional curve, c. So what we want to do is we want to integrate f of x, y over the curve, c, and so what happens just like when we integrate a two-dimensional function over the x-axis, we're going to be finding the area of the wall, and in this case it's going to be a curved wall, created by um, going along the curve C and then going up to the function, so the height of that wall at each point is determined by f of x, y. To do this, we partition the curve into small arcs and use a process similar to Riemann sums. So in a um, previous section, we used s, a lowercase s, for arc length. And so if I partition my curve into these um, sub-arcs, then each little sub-arc I'm going to call delta s. The area of each Riemann rectangle will be the function value at a point in the sub-arc times the arc length of the sub-arc. So if I look at a little rectangle um, defined on that wall, the height of the rectangle is going to equal f of x sub i, y sub i, where x sub i, y sub i is some point in the sub-arc um, delta s with length delta s. So I get the area of that rectangle is f of x sub i, y sub i, times delta s. When we add up all of the rectangles and let the number of partitions approach infinity, we get the integral over curve c of f of x, y, z, ds. That would be if our function had um, was a function of three variables, x, y, and z. In my example I gave, it was a function of two variables. So we would get the line integral over curve C of f of x, y, ds. So these two defined line integrals, integral over C of f of x, y, z, ds, or in integral over curve C of f of x, y, ds, those are called line integrals. Now, in order to evaluate line integrals, we're going to need to review a few things from earlier in the course. The first review item is um, recall from earlier sections that a curve in space can be parameterized by a vector function r of t equals g of t i plus h of t j plus k of t k. So it's a um, vector function, and if I only had um, the x and y components, then I'd just leave off the k. In order to evaluate a line integral over c, we need to find a parameterization for the curve c. So let's do a couple practice. Practice one, we want to graph the vector equation r of t equals 6 cosine t i plus 6 sine t j, and t is between pi over 2 and pi. So I know this only has an i and j component, so it's going to be in the xy plane. So it's not three-dimensional. I can just draw my x-axis and y-axis. And what I want to do is evaluate r at the starting point for t. So I'll do r of pi over 2. So that's equal to 6 cosine of pi over 2i plus 
plus 6 sine of pi over 2j, and I just evaluate that. So that gives me 0i plus 6j. So over on my um, xy plane, I'm going to plot that point, 0, 6. Now I'm going to pick some other um, theta values, or t values in this case, between pi over 2 and pi. So I know we have a few special angles in there. I'm going to start with 2 pi over 3. So r of 2 pi over 3 equals 6 times negative 1 half i plus 6 times square root of 3 over 2 j. And if I evaluate that in decimal form, I get negative 3i plus 5.2j. So over on my xy plane, I'm going to plot that point, negative 3, 5.2. The next special angle is r of 3 pi over 4. That's equal to 6 times negative root 2 over 2i plus 6 times positive root 2 over 2j, and in decimal form that gives me negative 4.2i plus 4.2j. So I plot negative 4.2 comma positive 4.2 on my xy um, plane. Now notice that all of these are in the second quadrant, and that would make sense because I'm dealing with cosine and sine, and my t, which is representing an angle, is between pi over 2 and pi. So I have one more special angle between pi over 2 and pi, and that's r of 5 pi over 6. That's equal to 6 times negative root 3 over 2i plus 6 times 1 half j. So I get negative 5.2i plus 3j and I plot the point negative 5.23 on my xy plane. Now I want to evaluate the ending t value, pi. So I'll do r of pi equals 6i plus 0j. So I just picked some t values in the range that they gave me and evaluated my r vector function there. Now these paths, c, they have a direction, so I always want to start at the beginning t value and end at the ending t value. And so I end up starting at 0, 6 and ending at negative 6, 0. And I put the arrow on my curve to indicate the direction that the path was traced out. So I always want to start with the lower t, end with the upper t. So that's an example of um, using a vector function to parametrize a curve. Now notice that this traced out a quarter of a circle. So if I didn't have the restrictions on t, r of t equals 6 cosine of ti plus 6 sine of tj would be a circle of radius 6. So in your homework, if they ask you to parametrize a circle, you can do it using the r cosine of ti plus r sine of tj. Let's do another example. Practice 2, graph the vector equation r of t equals 2ti plus quantity t squared minus 1 quantity times k. And t is ranging from negative 1 to 1. Now in this case, um, the i component is like my x, the k component is like my z. So x equals 2t, and z equals t squared minus 1. y equals 0, because there's no j term. So I know it's a three-dimensional vector parametrization because it has an x and a z, but it's like I have a plus zero j, so y equals zero. Now on this one, instead of just um, plugging in random points between negative one and one for t, 
I'm actually going to try to find the relationship between x and z. So since x equals 2t, I know that x over 2 equals t. I'm going to take that and plug it in for t squared in the, in the um, z equation. And so I get z equals x over 2 quantity squared minus 1, which gives me the parabola z equals 1 fourth x squared minus 1. So now I'm ready to find the starting point and ending point based on my starting t-value and ending t-value. So my starting point is when t equals negative 1. So I plug that into x. x equals 2t. So x equals 2 times negative 1, which is negative 2. My z equals 1 fourth x squared minus 1. So z equals 1 fourth times negative 2 squared minus 1, which is 0. So I know that my starting point is x is negative 2, y is 0, because there's no j term, and z is 0. I need my ending point also. So I have my ending point when t equals positive 1, x equals 2 times 1, which is 2, and I plug that x value into z equals 1 fourth x squared minus 1. So z equals 1 fourth times 2 squared minus 1, which is 0. So my ending point is going to be 2, 0, 0. So I draw my x, y, z axes. I'm going to um, have my negative x-axis as a dotted line. And I have my starting point, negative 2, 0, 0. My ending point is 2, 0, 0. And now I want the z-intercept. So I know um, the z-intercept is going to happen when x and y are both 0. So I get x equals 0, y equals 0, and then plug the 0 in for x in z equals 1 fourth x squared minus 1, and I get z equals negative 1. So my z intercept, intercept is at 0, 0, negative 1. So I draw my negative z axis as a dotted line, 0, 0, negative 1, and I have a par parabola, a parabolic function. Now remember these have a direction, Starting point was negative 2, 0, 0. Ending point was positive 2, 0, 0. And so I put an arrow on my parabola showing which direction it was traced out. So there's the parametrization of that parabola in um, R3. R of t equals 2ti plus t squared minus 1k was the parametrization of z equals 1 fourth x squared minus 1 and they gave us the starting and ending t values. Okay now just um, one more thing to review before we can put it all together into the line integrals. In the section about arc length we developed the arc length parameter. If you need to review this, you can go watch the videos about arc length. And um, this gave us s of t, the arc length parameter, s of t equals the integral from a to t of the magnitude of v of u du. From this equation and the fundamental theorem of calculus, we know that ds, so the derivative of um, the arc length, ds equals the magnitude of v of t times dt. So that was um, from directly from our fundamental theorem of calculus, taking the derivative of s. So this will be really important 
when we are plugging it into our um, line integral formula. Remember the line integral is the integral over curve C of f of x, y, z, ds, and using this form of ds, magnitude of v of t dt, we get this line integral is the integral over curve C of f of x, y, z times the magnitude of v of t dt. So that's if I have a three variable function. If I have a two variable function, the integral over c of f of x, y, ds equals the integral over c of f of x, y, magnitude of v of t, dt. Remember, v of t is just the velocity function. So if you're given the position r, your parameterization of the curve, then v is the derivative of r. So let's put it all together evaluating a line integral. To integrate a continuous function f of x, y, z over a curve c, first we find a smooth parameterization of c, r of t equals g of t i plus h of t j plus k of t k, where t ranges from some constant a to b. Next, we evaluate the integral as the integral over c of x, y, z, ds equals the integral from a to b, so my t bounds that we're given, of f of g of t, h of t, k of t. So I'm plugging the x, y, and z from the curve, from r, into my function f times the magnitude of the velocity of t times dt. So in the next video, we'll actually go through an example of using this formula. But now you have all the pieces, the parameterization, the ds equals magnitude of velocity times dt.